<laughs> hey there, I'm Lisa, the Love Coach. And every Monday I go live on Facebook. And then I share the post in my Facebook group. So if you're catching me on the replay, hello. And if you want to connect with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can. You can send me a DM. I'm always welcome to those. And um, you could also head on over to my website, lovequestcoaching.com, and you can email me there. You can also book your session with me, jump on my schedule, and we can hash out whatever it is you have going on, get you the clarity that you're looking for, the solutions that you need to get from where you are right now to where you want to be, right? So I also... Go live every day on TikTok, which is a very dynamic conversation because the algorithm over there works very, very differently from Facebook. And so if you want to catch that, I'm typically live on TikTok every day, every day from 4.30 to like around 4.35 in that window I start and I go until around 6 p.m. So it's a full 90 minutes and it's great over there because it's far more interactive People are writing in. It's hilarious. We have a great time. Many of you probably have found me over on TikTok, which is perhaps how you got into this Facebook group or onto my Facebook, however way you're finding this content. So this content is going to be more educational, more information-based. Yes, I give lots of information over on my TikTok, but TikTok is way more interactive and it's more of a hot seat um, Q&A type of dynamic, whereas this is more just presented content. So if you want to grab a notebook and a pen, um, there might be some things in here that I'll share with you that can help you advance in your personal development. And let's dig into the content. Usually what I do is I um, make a list of some topics that the people who write me um, have, like the common ones of the week, and then I share them and address them because probably other people are going through similar, right? So why not just share those things? So this week there were obviously, and as always, I wrote an article about narcissistic abuse and why people att attract narcissists in the first place. So you can find that over on my website as well. And many people who read that article find this Facebook and this group. So it's like a little circle, right? People are Googling, they find me that way, they see that article, and then they want to join the group. Awesome. So much support available for you. And if you want to take that next step in resolving what is at the root of why predatory narcissists see you as prey, right? Because they're predators and they're looking for certain kinds of people. And we're going to get into what that is right like now. Um, but if you want to resolve that after you hear what I'm about to tell you and you want to connect with me, you certainly can over by my website, lovequestcoaching.com. Okay, so let's get into that first topic, which is why do people go for certain people? Why do predatory narcissists pick out certain types of people? What characteristics are they looking for so that if you have any of these characteristics, any of these traits that makes you a nice little wounded little bird, little narcissist prey, right? They prey upon people. So you want to make sure that you are not a match for them. So let's get into what makes people a match for the predatory narcissist so that they can shift and not be that prey anymore. You don't want to be perfect prey to a predator. So let's understand what the predator is looking for. So First and foremost, the predator is always looking for someone who lacks self-love. If you are insecure, if you are wounded in any way, emotionally wounded, you doubt yourself, you are looking for external validation. That's where that love bombing comes in, right? They love to give that validation and the people who they prey upon eat it all up. They're like, nom, 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 love bomb me. I love it. I love it. I never heard these things from my mom and my dad when I was little. I never had enough of this attention and affirmation. So now in swoops narcissist and he gives you that, well, to the person who's a prey, you know, to them. 
and they eat it all up. So love bombing can only happen when there's a giver of love bombing and a recipient of love bombing. But there are people out there who can't even distinguish what is good treatment, what is proper courtship, what is genuinely good treatment, trying to get to know you, being nice to you, um, versus predatory, narcissistic love bombing, right? So one of the things I teach people when we coach together and we go deeper in your own personal experience and, and situation is that ability to, to distinguish, are they just a good guy or are they a predator? So it does take a bit of time, three dates probably, to kind of see how they show up. And this leads to the next thing. They look for people who lack boundaries, right? So if you care too much about being in a relationship, so much so that you don't care with who, and you're just like, oh, this guy is nice to me and that's enough for you. And you don't care about consistency over time. You don't care about putting forth a boundary and see how he reacts to a boundary. Does he respect your boundaries? Does she respect your boundaries? Because narcissists, histrionics, they come both male and female. Predatory people, both male and female. Uh, gender has nothing to do with this type of, um, you know, cluster B mindset, right? So... When you're dealing with these people, it's important for you to be able to set a boundary and stick to the boundary and be able to assert a consequence for the boundary. So I'll give you an example. If you're dating someone and you're on, you know, three dates with them and they seem nice um, and you're like, OK, I'm going to I'm going to see if I, you know, assert a boundary because they mentioned they want to hang out with me tomorrow night. And I can, but I, I'm only available until 10 p.m. And I'm going to assert a boundary and then you do and they try to get you to stay out longer. They get you to try, they try to get you to invite them over, right? Like you're not ready for that kind of date yet, yet they're angling to get over and, and, and come into your home space. And so what that ends up feeling like in your body could be like this in your chest, like a tightness or in your stomach, like a flip feeling in your stomach where you're feeling almost like a predator is preying upon you and you're feeling a little anxious, your breathing might change. So it's very important for you to regulate your nervous system, to learn how to regulate your nervous system. Because without self-regulation, these people will, they're again, predatory. So they're going to prey upon people who have a very weakened um, uh, ability to manage their nervous system. And how do you manage your nervous system? One way is deep breathing, right? So you're always grounded in the present. You aren't reactionary. You're not so easily lit up emotionally. You're more grounded in yourself, in your confidence. So when you say, I would love to see you tomorrow. However, I am only available until 10 p.m. So, and then they say, oh, that's okay. Why don't I just come over? And you then say, well, I'm not really ready for that yet, but I definitely want to get together. So how about we do something a bit earlier? Maybe we'll go for an early bite. And if they're like, oh, what's the big deal? I'll just bring over a bunch of food and we can just hang out. And then you say again, well, again, I'm not ready for that. And you just stay quiet and let them squirm in the silence because you're asserting a boundary. Oh, you're you're thinking I'm trying to you're I'm 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 trying to get into your space or don't worry, we won't have to have sex or don't worry, I'm not going to try anything. I'm just going to bring over food. And notice the language. They're trying to tell you what they are going to do. Right? So a lot of people who don't know how these narcissistic people operate will believe them and go along with them thinking Oh, he's just taking the lead. He's making the plans. He No, he's inviting you over your home after you clearly said you weren't ready for that. So there are very sneaky ways of overstepping boundaries. And if you aren't solid in your boundaries, you have no shot against these people. So one of the things, many things that I teach in my one-on-one um, -on -one coaching programs having specifically to do with narcissistic abuse recovery and reinvention 
is strengthening your self-esteem, self-worth, and boundaries, basically. Because without that, there's, there's no match. These people are predatory, and if you're going to walk around unable to assert a boundary and a consequence for that boundary, and in this case, with this guy, after date three, he's trying to angle over your house, getting over to your home, and he's not um, letting up on that, even though you say you're not ready, that's where you can come in and say, you know what, I, I think we're good here. Oh, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? Oh, you're being so sensitive. No, I'm not being sensitive. This is dating, right? And so how I date is I let people show me who they are. And you are showing me that you're not respectful of my boundaries. So that's a massive red flag to me. So all I said to you was, I am not ready to have you over my house. And yet you pushed and pushed and pushed. So we're good here. And you have to be prepared to dismiss these people, block them, and be done. Right? And that's how you handle that. That's how you handle asserting a boundary with a consequence. You can't just assert a boundary and leave yourself open for manipulation. You have to assert a boundary with a consequence, such as I remove myself from this person when the boundary is, is um, crossed. So there's a whole lot going on with boundaries. I teach everything having to do with boundaries because boundaries is very much rooted in the inner child, the wounded inner child who was taught to people please. And they were taught that love is earned. And they were taught that in order for you to be a good person, you have to acquiesce to the needs of everybody else. And so this becomes super toxic and it also bleeds into family members as well, which was the other thing on my list of stuff for this week where people were writing me in, several people writing, all about toxic relationships with siblings, with um, in-laws, that sort of thing. So how do you handle that, right? What if the narcissist is a family member? So plainly, you can choose what environment you want to be around. You have that option. You have that choice. If there's somebody in the family that you don't mesh well with, then you, A, have the right to remove yourself from that and make alternative plans. So I'll give you an example. I'm working with a client, and she has um, a sister, yet she also has a mother. The mother is incredibly narcissistic, and she typically pits the sister and the brother, the siblings, against each other. And the siblings are aware of this, but some of the siblings go along with it because they're still affected and impacted by the mom. But my client, with my help, has, break, has broken free from that, right? So she's been working with me for a couple of weeks, and her purpose of working with me was to break free from the chains of her narcissistic mother and the dynamic, the toxic dynamic that she has created between her and her siblings, so we went through every step of that together through our coaching. And one important step is managing the way you engage with the siblings and the people in your family who you do love, who are not toxic, right? But excluding the people who are. So she was recently very upset because, of course, the mother plans purposely this whole big dinner out for the sister. So it's the sister's birthday and she, mother, arranges this whole big thing purposely to exclude my client. So what was great about this was that it was a test to see if my client can regulate her nervous system, which she totally had like my support with and it was not an easy thing. She's like, my mother is literally planning a, a party for my sister. Not so much so she can have a party for my sister, but it's to get back at me. So, and, and her sister knew it. So her sister is trying to go in between she and the mom. And she's like, just come to my birthday and you don't have to be so stubborn. And my mom, and just because mom didn't tell you about it and I told you about it doesn't mean like you can't come, you have to come. And she's like, listen, your mother purposely excluded me. So, no, I'm not coming, but I'm going to take you out on our own. And we're going to have like a spa day and do a, a girl sister thing. Like, I want to celebrate you on your birthday also. We're going to hang out another time. 
this is ridiculous, sister says, flying monkey sister. This is ridiculous. I want you to be at my birthday. You and mom need to hash this out. You can't keep like being uh, against mommy and all this shit, right? So she's basically flying monkey putting guilt on the sister. So what does my client say at my recommendation? I told her, put together an invite. Just put together a quick invite to, via text. Say, say, um, you know, hey, Mel, um, Melanie is her name. So she's the sister. Hey, Melanie, would love to take you to spa day and fa lunch following. Let me know what weekend day works better for you. Saturday, right? Sa which Saturday works best coming up? Floats that over to her, and that was it. The ball is in the sister's court. Now, this is where my client, and for the purposes of this video, whatever, we'll call her Samantha. Okay, so Samantha tells me, you know, I sent that message three days ago. My sister hasn't said anything. She's pissed off because I'm not coming to her birthday that my mother is planning, and I don't want to go because it's a toxic environment, and I'm not feeding into my mother's bullshit anymore. I'm hired you. I feel better already. I feel like an adult. Um, it's really helping me. Like I, I, I'm not going backwards after making this investment of time, energy, money, all of this in working with you, Lisa. So what should I do? So I said, well, again, you have to, um, this is an opportunity for you to settle down that little inner child who values her family, family, um, is thought of as good when she's quiet and acquiescent, right? She's a good girl when she's quiet and acquiescent. And she doesn't point out the toxic bullshit she's seen as good, but it yet eats her up inside and she has resentments and all of this. And she chooses not to live that way anymore. Remind her of that. Remind her that, yes, I know that family matters so much to you, my precious little girl. This is how you speak to this inner child who's freaking out because she knows that this whole family event is happening and she's not there, right? So you turn to her and you say, my love, I love you so much. I am your family. And you and I stick together till death and beyond. There is no one else who will love you more than I. No one else who will care for you better than I. And this weekend, you and I are going to do something incredible. There is this fashion event at the mall. I'm on the guest list for it. We have a special luncheon. We're going to network with other fun ladies. We're going to see all the pretty things, all the dresses, the shoes, all of this. We're going to have fun. And we're just going to spend a lovely day together, you and me. How does that feel? Well, I want to go to the family. I, I want to see my sister. I don't. Okay, but you know what? Your sister, we sent her that invitation, remember? Yes, but she didn't write us back. Why didn't she write us back? No one's going to want to be with us anymore. We're going to be all alone. My love, we are never alone. We are never alone. And better to be alone than in bad company. And those people treat you poorly. Those people manipulate you. And I'm not allowing it anymore. So you are six. You get to go be six. So what do you want to do? Do you want to play Legos? Do you want to color in your coloring book? Do you want to go, I want to ride my bike. All right, cool. So you go ride your bike and you leave all the grown up stuff to me. But my goal for you, my beautiful child who I love so much, is to protect you from these manipulative people who make you feel bad, who make you feel nervous, who make you feel like you have to be perfect. We don't want to be around people like that. Okay? So you are free to go play with your Legos or ride your bike or do whatever. Good? Yeah, okay, I feel better. Right? So sometimes that inner conversation has to happen in order for you to talk to the wounded version of you, the little girl version of you, who would pick up the phone, call the sister, be like, bitch, I just sent you a fucking invite to go to like Ritz-Carlton for spa massages and a luncheon. And you don't even have the decency to respond. So fuck you. No, I don't want to take you anywhere for your birthday, right? That's woundedness. That's responding to people from a reactionary state of woundedness. But when you just float out a message to sister and say, hey, I want to take you to lunch and the Ritz-Carlton, we're going to do spa massages and then we're going to have lunch. 
let me know which Saturday is great for you. And you just float that over there knowing that there is no attachment to any outcome, right? If your sister says nothing, then it's nothing, right? Then it's nothing. And you let that hang there and you make your life so busy and fantastic that you don't give a shit about these passive aggressive people running game on your mind. That's the magic. That's how you practice stoicism, self mastery. So no one rattles your cage. These people, your whole life, they've been rattling your cage and playing you. And then when you wake up one day and you say, I don't like this. I don't like being treated this way. I don't like giving, 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 and giving some more only to have some psychopath, narcissistic father, mother, cousin, whatever, come at you in a way that is not acceptable. You're an adult. There's a way to be spoken to. There's a way to be respected at a certain, after, you know, you're not a child anymore and you're not going to tolerate being spoken to as one just so that they can get their way. They can get manipulation. They, they just don't tolerate it. So when you have a no tolerance for that, right? That's the thing. Establish a set of no tolerance. I do not tolerate one, two, three, four, five. Make your list of the bullshit you do not tolerate from friends, family, people you're dating, people you're romantically connected to, make different buckets. These are the exercises that I help my clients to do. So when you coach with me, we speak weekly for an hour. We handle all of the things that you're going through and we put you on this track of week to week to week, a progression so that you can learn how to heal this wounded inner child. You can learn how to advocate for them, how to stand up for them, protect them, guide them, discipline them when necessary, so that you, the true you, the you watching this right now, looking for information, wanting to develop yourself, that version of you can succeed. That version of you is set up for success. Whereas this little baby girl over here, poor thing, or boy, baby boy, baby girl, they're just trying to please so that they can get love. But when you give them the love unconditionally with guidance and care and self and discipline, right? That's all forms of love. Then they don't look outside of you anymore for the validation and attention. They don't look all the things that they're looking for in family members, in romantic relationships. They're no longer needing that and needing to be clinging to that because they have you to cling to. So this is all about you connecting with that wounded part of yourself. Now, let's talk a little bit about the different stages of your life and the ways to um, connect with them. Okay, so typically if you look at your life before age 20, the things that happen to you in those times of your life will impact how you show up in life, relationships, work, all aspects beyond 20, right? So you're being like a little sponge when you're, you know, infant to seven years old, you're like full on just sponge wavelength, right? Your brain is, that's why little kids at that age are so good with learning languages because they're just like in a state of, um, I think it's like, a, is it, I, I don't think it's theta. There is a, there's a wavelength that's going on at that time in your life. And that wavelength makes you very uh, suggestible, influential. Like you can be heavily influenced at that age. And you mimic things that you see. You know, that's why you'll see like a three-year-old and it'll like walk in the room and be like, fucker, 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 because it heard a parent saying it, right? They just parrot and absorb everything that's around them. Okay. So when you're looking at inner child work and the way I teach it is I like to look at the time between zero and five, right? As a, as a cluster, as a chunk of time. And some people can't remember anything in that time frame. That's totally fine. Even if you, some, I had a client that's like, Lisa, honestly, it's like I blocked out everything before age eight. So I'm like, all right, that's cool. Tell me about you at age eight. Right, I work with whatever memory of themselves that they come at me with, right? So I'll start off and say, okay, let's look at the ages zero to five. Like what, what memories do you have of anything? Like who was your favorite relative and what did you like to do? And what was your favorite toy and all of this? And those open-ended questions 
in a session will lead people to reveal things that are very um, revealing of their woundedness. So when I ask a question, okay, you're, you're, you know, five years old. Um, what, what did you do for fun? And the little girl is like, we, I don't remember ever having fun. Um, my mom was always working and we'd get kind of pushed off to other people to be watched. I was alone a lot. Um, I, I just remember feeling really bored and really alone. Okay, so that little five-year-old was neglected. Yes. Okay, so what did that five-year-old think about herself? Like, did what did she think about herself that I was bad? Interesting. Why did you? Why do you? Would you say that little girl thought you were bad? Well, my mother was never around. So interesting. So your mom was never around because she was working like two jobs, right? Trying to feed you and clothe you and all this. But you took it to mean as. There has to be something fundamentally wrong with me because my mother is never around. And she was like, yeah, like that's interesting because my adult self logically looks at that as my mom is just doing the best she could. She just had my dad left and she was left with two kids and she was trying to feed us and clothe us and provide for us. And we would stay with cousins. We'd stay with, you know, we would every other, other kids from school. Like we were kind of, you know, um, being um, handed off. A lot. There wasn't a lot of structure and stability. Interesting. Okay, so how did that make you feel? Like the lack of structure and stability. Like what was that about? Well, it made me feel really anxious, really nervous. I didn't, one time I left my doll and I got in trouble because I couldn't go to sleep without my doll and I left it at my aunt's house and my aunt lived like, like you know, a few blocks away. And I remember my mother getting really mad at me because she's like, it's 9.30 at night and you're still not sleeping. And now I have to go to your aunt's house and get this stupid doll. Like she made me wrong for wanting the doll. And then it was like, okay, well, that doll soothed you in some way. And you needed that doll to sleep because you were so ramped up. Your nervous system was jacked out. So that doll soothed you. And then when you couldn't have it because you forgot it, you got in trouble and you never should have gotten in trouble, right? That never should have happened. So do you want to go back to that little girl who's in the bed and she's afraid and she wants her doll and it's 930 at night and she knows she should have been asleep already for an hour and a half and she's not asleep and she's going to get in trouble, but she's so afraid and she doesn't have her doll and she's just miserable. Like, do you want to go and get her and like hang out with her for a bit? And my client typically will say yes. And then I demonstrate exactly how to reconnect with the wounded little girl or the wounded little boy, right? So what that would look like is the demonstration. And I would have my client assume the feelings and the emotions of that little five-year-old girl, right? So I would say to her, you know, close your eyes, breathe in, and do this three times, right? A brief, deep breathing. And I want you to imagine the feeling of you laying in that bed, yearning for that doll, right? And it's late at night to you because you're five. And you're bargaining in your mind, I can't sleep. I have to sleep. I want my doll. What do I do? And you call out to an adult. So I'm going to come to you. And I'm going to talk to you the way your mother should have spoken to you, right? So you yell out, mom, mom, I don't have my doll. I'm, a, I'm scared or whatever it is you say. Okay. And I'm going to demonstrate how this should have gone down for you. And this is what's going to begin your reparenting process. You're going to learn how to reparent yourself. Okay. So she's like, yeah, let's do it. That's great. She's, I'm like, do you feel her? Do you feel that little girl? Yes, yes, I do. I'm wearing like my Holly Hobby pajamas. Like I totally, I'm in the moment. So I'm like, okay. So I walk in and I sit on your bedside and I say, hey, little girly, my beautiful little precious sweetheart. What's the matter? You can't sleep? No. No, I can't sleep. Why? What's the matter? 
I'm afraid and I left my doll at Aunt Rosa's house up the street. When I stayed after school, I left my doll. So you've been laying here for an hour and a half, not knowing if you can get your doll. Honey, here's the thing. If you're afraid and you left your doll, just tell me. I'll make sure you get it back. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to call my sister, your lovely Aunt Rosa, and I am going to get your doll back so that you can go to sleep. I want you to go to sleep. You have kindergarten in the morning. You have to go play with your friends. Okay? Okay. Am I in trouble? Because I forgot it. I shouldn't have forgotten it. No, sweetheart. You're not in trouble. You had so many things going on. I was rushing you out of that house and getting us to the car and you had your book bag and all that. So you're not in trouble for leaving your doll. I'm going to go get it for you. We're going to sort this out. So what I need you to do, though, is I need you to just, you know, relax here, chill out. I'm going to call Rosa. She's going to come and drop off a doll. Okay? Cool. Kiss her on the head. You sit down by her side. You get out your phone. Do, 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 do. You call the Rosa. You're like, hey, girl, I have a favor to ask of you. I know it's 930 at night. I owe you big time. But, um, you know, little Stephanie over here left her doll. I know, I know, I have it, I have it, I know, but she can't sleep without her doll. So, would it be trouble for you to, you know, I can meet you halfway on the block. I don't want to leave her, but, you know, she needs her doll. No, 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 I'll come bring it right now. It's fine. The end, problem solved. So, when you didn't have parents with the emotional capacity and maturity to tend to you because they, too, were wounded... Right? So you have wounded parents parenting from a wounded place. They are going to wound you too. So this work, this inner work, is always an opportunity to break a generational trauma. It cuts it full stop. So the people out here who are watching this video, who have read some books, done some therapy, really committed themselves to their healing, what they are essentially doing is... Cutting the chain of generational trauma. Like you were called and put here at this time in the advancement and the time of earth and all this to purposely shatter your generational trauma. Like cut it off because you as a soul, you have to ascend to another dimensional plane that we are all elevating to on the planet. And this is why everyone is clamoring for this type of content and they're all about inner work and buying books and going on websites that you know help all these kind of self-help things and it's been kind of building and building but the internet you know over the last couple of years took it to the next level covid advanced it even more because people were like realizing holy shit i i went through covid and i came out like a total pussy like i thought i would be a total badass and i was a disaster so there were a lot of people that awakened to what was going on in the world during COVID and it forced them to go internal and really want to heal the core wounds that were driving them and a lot of the behaviors that they did during that time, whether it was excessive drinking, promiscuity, hooking up with exes, you know, hooking up with people random, just soothing that, that, that loneliness, right? And there's a lot of people who are operating from that wounded place. So now this work, inner child work, gets to the root of why people make the decisions they make in adulthood because they're not really making them. Instead, the wounded inner child is making those decisions for you. And a lot of it comes from things like when people say to me, Lisa, I should know better. I don't know why the hell I let my ex back into my life. Right? I don't know why I did this. I know he's an asshole. I know, she, or, or woman, same thing. I know she's manipulative. I know this. And yet, she just sweet talked me into dinner. She, I ended up taking her out to dinner. I ended up taking him out. I ended up cooking for him. Whatever ends up happening, it's as if I wasn't making the decision. It's as if something else had control over me. So whenever somebody uses those types of words, like, what the hell was I thinking? That's another buzz phrase, right? That you know you are not operating as your adult true self. You're operating from a wounded inner child. I don't know what I was thinking. This guy texted me at 11 o'clock at night and an hour later he was over my house. That's not you. That's your wounded inner child making the decisions. 
So the work that I do is I help adults to step into adulthood in all aspects of their life. There are many people that I coach. They're business people. They, you know, super successful, you know, well into the six figures in few self-made millionaires also, right? They comes to money and business. They got it down. But when it comes to interpersonal relationships, mainly with family and relationship relationships, romantic relationships, their inner child is running the show. So your adult is, you know, making the money, doing the thing, calling the shots on the business side, right? But once business time is over, you fall into this little girl stage or this little boy stage where you don't know how to handle yourself when it comes to relationships. So inner child work handles all of that in a very, like, I don't believe in re-traumatizing people. I believe in meeting them where they're at. So like in the case of my client, she gave me that example of, I remember one time I got in trouble because I needed my doll to go to sleep and my mother made a big deal about it. And she like yelled at me for being wrong for needing a doll at five years old. Like she insulted me, right? She made me wrong for needing that doll in order to sleep. And so there was a lack of being seen, heard, validated, right? Which is all about the need of being significant. So when you're made to feel insignificant, like your feelings don't count, your feelings don't matter, you are going to grow up codependent. You are going to grow up constantly seeking validation from others. So it's all tied into that place. So that's pretty much the basics, right? I go way deeper in the coaching aspect of this. So you can kind of learn more by going on my website. I have many articles on this stuff. You could also um, schedule your session with me one-on-one -on -one because, you know, your wheels might be turning watching this like, holy shit, I remember when I was eight and I was like left somewhere for hours, like my mother wouldn't come get me and I felt so embarrassed and I thought and like abandoned, like whatever your thing is, like this video, this footage, this whatever content could definitely inspire your wheels spinning and it can also inspire the other aspects of your life too, right? So it's not just, you know, ages zero to 10. It's also those teen years. So you're looking at ages 10 to 20 where your body changes, where you start noticing boys and girls, you start getting into that puberty, um, your relationships with your parents, the dynamic changes. So there's a lot of like rebellion that might happen and that's just rooted in, you know, Things that happened to you that should not have happened, right? None, none of it was your fault, should not have been blamed for any of it. And let's say hypothetically you did do something and you did screw up and you faced the consequences of that. Maybe you were punished or maybe the punishment may have been excessive. It may have even have been violent. And this leads to a whole other array of woundedness. So we dig into all of that, but we do it in a way that's kind of like a mission, right? Like we don't look at it like, okay, let's just talk about this shitty thing that happened ad nauseum and just talk about the shitty thing to talk about the shitty thing. I'm not about that. I'm about let's identify the wounded version of you who has a legitimate beef and a legitimate issue. And these psychopath grown-ups around them or these emotionally immature grown-ups around them or these emotionally neglectful grown-ups around them don't know how to meet those needs. So now we're going to go in there and we're going to get her or him. We're going to get that kid out of there so that they can feel better and they can feel seen, heard, protected, led, guided, etc. They can finally be with a grown-up who 100% is there for them. Not just when they can be, but all the time. So if you want to learn more about inner child work and how to get started and the deep intricacies of it, it's an awesome modality. It's the modality I used back in 2015 when I was doing my own post-divorce reinvention and recovery, flip it, recovery and reinvention, and really getting into my own healing and for me, it was codependency. So it was a lot of work and healing around that. So inner child work was the jam. It was the thing that really helped me to reconnect to myself and step into leadership, step into adulthood, which is incredibly empowering. So 
That concludes today's episode. Thanks so much for checking me out. Again, I go live on TikTok every day between 4.30 and 5, and I go for like 90 minutes. So hang out with me on TikTok. You can just research me, Lisa Concepcion. Over on TikTok, I am Lisa the Love Coach. Lisa the Love Life Coach 1A for First Amendment. All right, so until next time, if you have a DM and you want to reach out to me on DM, you totally can. All right, talk soon. Bye.